Welcome to How I Shoot, the show where we talk about your film production products shot with Kinefinity cameras. With me today is Toby Strong. Toby is an award-winning director and cinematographer. I'll put some links of his works in the description here below, so make sure you check that out. All right, Toby, thanks for joining the show. Good morning. It's so lovely to join with you. Thank you. All right, so Toby, briefly tell us what is your professional background, the training you had, uh, how did you come to filmmaking in general? Um, I've been a uh, director of photography for over 20 years now. I did not follow a traditional route, as many of my contemporaries haven't either. I got into it, I did a degree in engineering. I always saw beauty in the world and uh, wanted to bring that to others, so I led expeditions to, to take people to places. And then I was introduced to camera work and I realized that I could bring the magic of the world to a lot more people that way. So with my engineering, I managed to get a job for a year in the Amazon jungle, uh, building enclosures and sets to film animals in. And at that point, I bought a clockwork Bolex camera. That was my first camera. And I started learning, watching and assisting. That's the way I got into it. And then I've sort of been working through and now I split my time between wildlife and human documentaries. Been lucky enough to work on things like Human Planet, Planet Earth 2, Blue Planet 2, uh, Life Story, Seven Worlds, One Strange Rock, and with BBC, Nat Geo, uh, Discovery, Netflix. And my nature of my work is often in wild places, so I've worked on every continent and in most environments. Uh, I adore it. The key thing for me is narrative, always the story. But alongside that, I love new technology, and I like to adopt new technology when it comes along. So in my tool bag, when I'm uh, filmmaking, I have a lot of things to work with. So along with traditional cameras, I'll work macro long lens time-lapse. Uh, we'll do sliders, gimbals, cranes, drones. So everything is there for me to use when I come to tell a story. Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting. So from your Vimeo, I can see that you go to very remote areas, as you say, in all continents. Can you tell us a bit about the most remote areas you went to and and how you pack your camera and stuff and how you, you work with that there? So I can just talk about the last few months. I got my Mavo L off at the end of October, I think, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, I was in Nepal up on the Tibet border, and we were filming at about five and a half thousand meters. Uh, from there, I went down to Antarctica. That was pretty extreme filming. We were down to about minus 40 at times, and then we would move outside, inside, going from minus 40 to plus 40. So that was really difficult for the cameras at those temperature changes. Uh, from there, uh, my last shoot I did was out to Bolivia, and that was again at altitude, but only about 3,000, three and a half thousand meters. But there I was doing a lot of filming at night. So I was looking for a lot of low light activities as well. I will often be filming from yeah high altitude to night filming, day filming, going from yeah minus 40, minus 50 to the same in deserts, plus 40, plus 50. So real extreme environments with dust, sand, uh, snow, rain. It really does put cameras uh, through its tests where I film. Mm -hmm. And are there any issues related to temperature or, or dust, uh, things like that? So I'm going to talk specifically about the Mavoela. When I got the camera, I loved what it promised. I was very apprehensive because the only reports I could read, people were worried about reliability and weatherproofing on it. So I was nervous taking it to altitudes, to these big temperature changes. Nothing's gone wrong with it. I've been incredibly impressed. Yes, I've taken good care of it, but I've had dust blown through it. I've had snow on it. We've had some rain come through. I've taken good care of it, looked after it, but it's been completely reliable. What I was amazed by, I went from a filming situation where I was at minus 40. I then went into a situation that was plus 40. Normally, we have to be really careful, obviously, with those big temperature changes. The Mavo was perfect, not a foot wrong anyway. Yeah, I've been hugely impressed. And how did the camera's size, weight and ergonomics serve you in those situations? Yeah, I'm really lucky. The programs I get to work on have good budgets, so I can choose the cameras and equipment that I need for the job. 
And I specifically chose the Mavo and I invested in it because a lot of the time I'm working with a big Ronin 2 on a tilter arm with the red Ari. It's amazing. It's brilliant. But there's time where it does compromise my creativity, not being able to move as quickly or as much. So my primary reason for going for the Mavo was, yeah, 6K full sensor. That's exquisite um, when I'm using fast lenses. I love the look of it. The other thing is the size. It really is. So I can put this on a Ronin S and I've got that and I use that all the time. So I can have that in one hand. I can be walking around, moving through uh, building small spaces in and out of um, tents, vehicles. And I've got 6K full sensor on a gimbal setup. It's this small. And, and that for me is why I went for it. I, I have a cinema camera in this tiny gimbal package and, and that nothing else can do that. And I'm getting amazing results from it. I did have a worry when I went out to uh, Northern Nepal. Uh, that was quite a long lens shoot. So yes, I was doing the gimbal, but I also needed to put it on the Canon 50 to 1000. Um, I got a block made up, put it on there. Not a problem at all. So, yeah, it sits there on the end. of It looks ridiculous. You've got this huge lens with this tiny little camera on the back. But that, that worked great. It's completely adaptable. If I needed to put it on the vehicle, I've had it on my Ronin 2 as well, on the tilter arm, bouncing around off the side. Yeah, it's so, yep, the, the size and image is why I went for it. And it works in every situation. And do you also do some handheld shooting? Yeah. At times, I do a lot of handheld. So what I've been, I use an easy rig a lot. It's saved my back over the years and I, I rate it so highly. If I'm going for a long time, yeah, I'll use the easy rig and just hang off it if it's not a gimbal situation. But what I'm finding more and more is often I'm not needing the easy rig for the shorter takes and things. Like with a little handle, I can just have this and, and I can be going for hours. You know, and it's giving me that flexibility and creativity to get the camera into places that I just can't do normally. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll often I'll strip away all the toys and, yeah, I'm just handheld and I can be here and here and here. And that small size is allowing me to hold the camera in positions for longer that I wouldn't normally be able to. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the different settings you use in the camera. So what, what is your, your go to setting for, let's say, between bright daylight and, and low light? Yeah, so one of the highlights on the camera is the dual ISO, where we can go from 800 to just over 5,000. It's extraordinary um, how little noise there is at 5,000. Yeah, I'm up at altitude, I'm down in Antarctica, there is a vast amount of light, so I'm using 800. Having the digital NDs in there is extraordinary. So I can dial that right in and I can be in bright sunlight, 1.2, 1.4. That's amazing for me that I can do that. And I can go from that, I've got all of the PL and the EEF with the digital NDs in and without them. So, mm -hmm. for instance, in Bolivia, we were shooting at night and I just had the smallest light. So I'm at just over 5,000, 1.2, straight through on the filter. I need so little light to operate on that. And, and that, that, that's what I'm doing. Between those two ISOs and with the digital NDs that are, there are on the Mavo, I'm completely covered. And how do you expose the camera in general? Like, do you have an external monitor with exposure tools or how do you do it? What, with different cameras, I work a lot and trust my eye. So with the Mavo monitor on, I've done it in controlled situations and I know how the monitor looks so that during the day when I'm filming, I can trust it. So most of the time I'm trusting the Mavo monitor. I'm also throwing a signal off to the director so they can keep an eye on it as well, or my AC. But most of the time I've checked it, I know how the monitor looks and I trust trust my eye. You, you mentioned you send the signal to your director. How, how do you do that? Different ways. I've been using um, an Axun small system, which can go on there which gives us a little thing that can go to all Apple devices. If I'm going super lightweight, so if I'm on the Ronin S, that's perfect for that, so I've got no additional bulk. I also mm -hmm. have the back that goes on to the Mavo, so if I don't mind the camera being a bit bigger, that's what I've got, and that uses the Dark Tower system, which is integral, 
and that sends a signal back. The Dark Tower, I know not many people use it. It's incredible. I did tests with it with Teradek down in Antarctica when I had some time. The Dark Tower smashed it, um, the Teradek out of the water. It's amazing. It's robust. It's a strong signal, almost no latency. So yeah, I, I, I found the Dark Tower brilliant. And then if I'm putting it on the Ronin S and I need a super small package, then I'm using the little Axum system to send a Wi-Fi signal that people can use on their iPads. Let's talk a bit about your post workflow. There's not a lot I can say about the post workflow due to the fact that what I'm working on, we've got a, an extraordinary team that, that takes the footage and then it's going through every system known to man before it comes out on TV or cinema. Um, I like to use a LUT um, on the monitor and that will change and I'll talk that through the director about what sort of thing we're looking at. Again, I will have spent some time before I go into a shoot knowing how it looks with without the LUTs so I can trust my eye. But I do like to know, have a feel for how it will look later on. Um, but that's just a guide for me. So it's... It's a massive workflow that's going to happen in further down the line when, when it leaves me. Um, and as DP on these things, I have, sometimes I'll go in on the grey, but often once I finish shooting, it's taken and off it goes. Do you get like guidelines which you have to follow from the productions? Like uh, it has to be ultra HD and like 25 frames per second, or are you mostly free and, and they deal with it? No, we'll have pretty strict. So working on something like One Strange Rock, um, obviously that's NTSC, so I've got my guidelines there. And we have, you know, we're pretty strict on our quality, on what we're shooting on, what codecs. Um, and then we've got guidelines with compression, with how much off speed we're going. Um, so yeah, that we get a pretty strong steer from production on those sorts of things. And then we'll talk through whether we're going off speed or not, and then how much compromise we can go when we're going off speed how much quality we can compromise depending on how far we want to go. So yeah, that's we, that's pretty strong, clear guidelines that I've got to work within. Mm, talking about high-speed recordings, there are different settings in the, in the Mavo LF. What's your go-to setting for that? A lot of the time what I'm working on has sync elements. So we'll try and stick to multiples of the base frame rate. So 25, 50, 75, 100. It's not often I'm going over 75, but there's odd shots where we do. Um, and obviously on this, I can be hitting, I think it's about 200 frames at, at HD, which is just amazing. And so for those few shots, we've got that buffer in the production deliverables to allow to drop down to say HD for a small percentage. And there we can throw it to 200 or 200 plus frames a second. But I'll have those settings dialed in where you've got the custom um, custom settings. So I've got like one to six. So I'll just have those dialed in depending on the day I'm going into. And then I just know where they're there. So if I need them really quickly, I can just punch through the, the different settings. When you mentioned that you go off into remote areas, obviously there's a whole issue with download and secure the footage. How, how do you deal with that? How many SSDs do you have and when and, and how do you secure the footage? We are often remote, but due to the nature of the productions we're working on, we do need support. So we will invariably have a generator minimum every other night. We have to charge batteries. So we will always be in a situation to be able to download. If not, no, we'll download every day. If not every two days for extremely rare situations. So I've got four half terabyte SSDs. Two of them are Kinefinity. Two of them are the Angel Birds. If I need more, so those very rare situations, we'll just take a bundle more. But generally four half terabytes get me through a day. Mm -hmm. All right. As my last question, I want to know from you, if you have uh, one wish, what features or settings would make the Marvel LF uh, even better? Um, you can even have multiple wishes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have multiple. Because it's a new camera, my main thing I want, it's never let me down. But I want to be able to trust it. So I would love to see Ken Affinity make it more robust. Just the weatherproofing, the general build, like on the handle... I reiterate, it's never let me down, but I would like to see them work more on the weatherproofing and the robustness. With regards to settings, I would love, I use, I never use the colors on focusing, 
but I would love to see the focus sharpening on the on the Kinefinity monitor. That's something I, I would really like to see. Touchscreen on the monitor, not vital, but that would be nice. And I'd like to get a warning, like a 30 second warning before the battery dies or the SSD fills. Um, but apart from that, oh, one last thing. So the little Axiom system with sends a Wi-Fi signal, so you can pick it up on the iPad. I know the guys, Kinefinity, are working on the new app. Hopefully that'll be integrated in it. Um, but yeah, it would be great for those around to be able to use their own devices as a monitor. But apart from that, it's a, it's a pretty awesome camera. Mm -hmm. And any any internal features like any resolutions or frame rates that uh, you would like to see in the future? No, I, I think the fact we're shooting at 6K full frame in a, such a small package, I, I don't want to wish for things that are impossible. It already delivers the impossible. So I'm not going to wish for any more with regards to resolution or quality or codecs. They're, they're already delivering more than anyone else. So I'm, I'm pretty happy there. All right. All right. That uh, sums it up for our interview today. I want to say one more time, please check the description of this video to check out Toby's, um, some of his works. And we will see you next time. Thank you, Toby, for coming. Thank you so much.